Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on personal services businesses in Part 4A, and in particular, the recent ATO draft practical compliance guidance or guidelines on when they will consider applying Part 4A resources to a, a personal services business situation. Very shortly, I'm going to introduce Kate uh, Chalker, who's going to be doing the presentation today and working her way through the PCG and its application. Uh, and uh, But before I do that, I'll just run through a couple of system features. Uh, we have a chat box uh, which you can put your questions and answers in. Uh, in terms of that, um, those questions and answers, or questions, I should say, we'll provide the answers, hopefully. Um, there's a fair bit for Kate to cover today. So uh, if you do put a chat uh, in and we don't get a chance to respond to it during the presentation, uh, don't fear. Uh, we have a record of them all and we'll come back to you separately uh, in relation to your query. So just um, in relation to that chat, if, if we do run out of time and we don't get a chance to talk to them, we will talk to the, the chats. We will come back to you separately on those. Uh, over on the right hand side of your screen, uh, the one version I look at anyway, um, there should be an option with files that will allow you to download the presentation. Uh, again, if you fail, forget to do that, just shoot us an email and we'll send you a copy. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, you will be sent an email asking for feedback. Uh, we do um, uh, take all feedback on board, and particularly in relation to topics. Uh, so if you could take the time to complete that, it's a very short survey. I remind you that this session will be recorded and will later be put on our YouTube channel and eventually uploaded to our website. Um, so just bear that in mind if you are asking questions. Obviously, we'll vet client details and so forth, uh, but uh, the session will be recorded. So I'd like to introduce Kate Chalker. Many of you will already know Kate. Uh, she works here in the Sydney office uh, and is very well uh, re uh, resourced in terms of her knowledge of tax law uh, and currently or almost completing her Masters of Taxation and, of course, shooting the lights out there, as you'd expect in terms of her grades. So I'll pass over to Kate and uh, let her get cracking. Thanks for that, Adrian, and hello, everybody. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, I've got a fair bit to cover in today's session, so I will dive straight in. So I'm sure that all of you are well aware that recently there was a draft practical compliance guideline released by the ATO. That came out on the 28th of August, and I'm sure that since then, your inbox has been flooded with different views and commentary uh, on just what that PCG means. Uh, but essentially, uh, it, was, it was released to address the application of Part 4A uh, within the 1936 Tax Act and how that applies to personal services income arrangements, which involve personal services entities that conduct personal services businesses. Uh, apologies for all the acronyms that I will be using in today's webinar. Uh, and so the draft guideline, it sets out what the ATO's approach will be to both identifying and managing the tax avoidance risks that are related to PSI, particularly where you have scenarios that involve the alienation of income or various income splitting strategies. So in terms of what we will cover in today's session, before we dive into the specifics of the PCG, uh, we'll just take a step back and recap on what the PSI rules are, so how they apply in terms of attribution of income and also limiting particular deductions uh, to personal services entities. Uh, and of course, as part of that, we'll need to also recap on what is a personal services business. So we'll briefly go through what are the different qualifying tests in order to be considered a PSB uh, and what it means if you do uh, attain that PSB status. And then we will look at the draft PCG that was recently released. Uh, we'll consider uh, the different types of scenarios that it can apply to, uh, if there's any particular exclusions from the draft PCG. Then we'll look at part 4A generally, what it means, how it applies. Uh, and then in particular, 
we'll look at the, the risk assessment framework that was included within the draft PCG. So within that, the ATO has set out different indicators of low risk arrangements compared to higher risk arrangements. So we'll spend some time going through each of those different indicators. And then from there, within that PCG, uh, the ATO did include, I think it was 13 different worked examples um, of how they might dedicate part for a, uh, sorry, how they might dedicate resources to looking into part for a issues within different scenarios. So we'll go through four of those examples, two of which they would consider low risk uh, and two of which they would consider higher risk uh, to get a bit of a feel uh, for how that might work in practice. And then I'll touch a bit on record keeping and different evidentiary requirements. If there were to be a review or an audit conducted by the ATO, what are the types of documents that you would want to make sure you have on file to be able to produce to try and shut down a part for a argument? Uh, and then finally, I'll just touch on where we are at currently in terms of the draft PCG, uh, what happens from here uh, and what happens once uh, the PCG is finalised by the ATO. All right, so as I mentioned, we'll just briefly recap on what are the PSI rules. So what is personal services income to start with? So that refers to income that's earned primarily as a reward for an individual person's efforts or skills. And so you can contrast this with any income that's generated through the use of assets, through the sale of goods, or through the structure of a business. And the PSI rules, they are contained within the 1997 Tax Act, and they're designed to prevent individuals from using interposed entities, such as companies, partnerships, or trusts, to avoid or to minimise their tax liabilities. And in terms of the provisions that uh, are contained within the PSI rules, there's two main ones being the attribution of income and also the limitation of deductions. So the first one being income attribution, the rule specifies that any personal services income has to be attributed to the individual who performed the services and not to the entity through which the income is channeled, if you will. The second key provision says that any entities that happen to receive personal services income, they have restricted deductions available to them. And the purpose of that is to ensure that the deductions align with the actual services that are provided by that entity. In terms of what, what is the purpose of the PSI rules, it's really twofold. Uh, the first purpose is to prevent the use of any tax avoidance strategies that aim to shift personal service income through different entities to reduce the overall tax liability, and also to ensure that the tax burden of the income earned for personal services remains on the individual who actually provided those services. Okay, the next concept that we'll recap is what is a personal services business? Um, and the reason why that is important to consider is that a, a personal services entity will not be subject to the PSI rules that I just went through if it does qualify as a personal services business. And so in order to qualify as a PSB, the entity needs to pass at least one of the following four tests. So the first of those tests is what we call the results test. And so in order to pass that one, the entity needs to be paid to achieve a specific result. The entity needs to use its own tools and equipment, and it has to be responsible for rectifying any mistakes. And additionally, 
at least 75% of the personal services income earned by that entity has to be directed towards producing a specific result. So if that results test were to be satisfied, uh, then the entity would qualify as a PSB and the PSI rules wouldn't apply. The second test that could be considered is the unrelated clients test. And under that test, uh, the personal services entity has to receive less than 80% of its total income from one entity or its associates. And it must also provide services to at least two unrelated clients. So unrelated from each other and also unrelated from the entity itself. And further to that, the services that are provided by the entity have to be offered to the general public or at least a section of the general public. So that's the second test. The third one is the employment test. And under this test, uh, the entity has to employ or contract others to help perform the work that generates the personal services income. And at least 20% of the main principal work uh, has to be done by others or the entity has to employ apprentices for at least six months. And finally, the fourth test uh, that could be relied on to qualify as a PSB is the business premises test. And for this one, the entity has to use business premises exclusively for conducting the PSI activities. Uh, with less than 80% of the income coming from the same entity. And also there's a requirement for the premises to be separate from the private or client premises. So I've obviously run through those fairly quickly and I could certainly expand on those a lot more, um, but there is a lot to get through today. Um, but just in terms of what that means, if, uh, if an entity were to meet one of those tests, it means that the entity can enjoy certain tax advantages and would be treated similarly to a regular business entity. Uh, but the drawback and, and the thing that we're focusing on today uh, because of the draft PCG is that even though uh, if you've got a PSE that qualifies as a PSB uh, and so the PSI rules don't apply, it doesn't mean that Part 4A can't apply um, if the personal services income is being distributed um, to people other than the key individual. And so that's what we'll be exploring uh, predominantly in today's webinar. All right, so the draft PCG, which came out recently, um, the objective of it was to clarify how the ATO will apply Part 4A to different PSI arrangements where you do have those entities conducting personal services businesses. You might recall that back in 2022, when TR 2022-3 was released, that was the ruling on um, PSI and PSBs, that the ATO did mention there uh, that um, PSEs conducting PSBs uh, there could still be the application of Part 4A. Uh, and in that tax ruling, the ATO did set out some of the key considerations that would be taken into account um, when working out whether the ATO would pursue a Part 4A argument. But the point of this draft PCG is really to expand uh, on that line of thought and to give some more guidance as to what are the different risk indicators uh, and what are some of the examples uh, to help taxpayers ensure that they're complying with these rules? So the scope of the application of the draft PCG, it will apply to different alienation arrangements. So it will apply where we've got a personal services entity that derives personal services income and the PSI rules don't apply because the entity is conducting a personal services business. So that's the extent to which the draft PCG will have any application. 
it won't apply in these different scenarios. So it won't apply if we've got an entity that's generating income from sources other than personal services income, for example, the sale of goods or income producing assets. If we're in that kind of circumstance, we don't need to be concerned uh, with this draft PCG. Another instance in which uh, the PCG won't apply is if we've got an incorrect PSB self-assessment. So, for example, if we have an entity that incorrectly assesses itself as a personal services business uh, and assumes that the PSI rules don't apply, if that actually turns out to not be true um, and the reality is that it doesn't meet one of those four tests, to be a personal services business, um, then uh, the PSI rules would naturally apply. And so uh, this draft PCG wouldn't have any application. And the last instance where the draft PCG wouldn't apply is where you've actually got direct income assessment going to the individual. So if you've got the key individual and not the entity itself, being assessed on the personal services income, then we don't need to worry about this draft PCG. But as I mentioned, this draft PCG is really just affirming and expanding on uh, the ATO's earlier guidance in TR 2022 slash three, where it was indicated that part 4A could still apply even if the entity qualifies as a personal services business especially in cases where you've got uh, tax avoidance schemes. Okay, next we'll look at part 4A, which of course is the focus uh, of the draft PCG. And so part 4A, which is contained within the 1936 Tax Act, uh, it aims to prevent tax avoidance by targeting any kind of scheme that has the dominant purpose of reducing tax liabilities. And so it, it applies to arrangements that exploit legal loopholes or engage in some sort of artificial transaction to gain a tax benefit. And so what the draft PCG says is that part 4A can apply to PSI arrangements where you have one of two things. You have either income splitting or profit retention. They're the two uh, predominant circumstances where part 4A could potentially apply. So firstly, if you've got the personal services income being divided among various entities or individuals, and that would result in a reduced overall tax burden, might be a part 4A problem. And equally, if you've got income being retained within the personal services entity, normally a company, if that's going to create a tax benefit, then that might also raise a part 4A issue. Of course, when we're dealing with part 4A, we're looking at the dominant purpose test. And so if part 4A is to apply, the ATO or the Commissioner of Taxation would need to determine what is the dominant purpose of the scheme. And so for these types of PSI arrangements, the ATO would be looking at whether the primary aim of the arrangement is to gain a tax benefit. And then secondly, if there has actually been a tax benefit. So if there has been significant income diversion or retention within the entity, that would result in a lower tax rate. As I mentioned, one of the key things within the draft PCG that the ATO provided is this two-part uh, risk assessment framework to try to, uh, excuse me, to try to categorize arrangements as either low risk or higher risk. And so some of the indicators uh, of a low risk arrangement would be where you have either full assessment to the individual. So the entire net personal services income being received by the entity is fully assessed to the individual who earned it. And so there would be no tax benefit resulting there. And also where you have 
uh, non-tax related retention. So if there is any income being retained within the personal services entity, it's being retained there for a legitimate purpose. For example, if the entity is looking to uh, acquire certain assets or if the funds are being used to fund employee benefits, that's the type of situation where we would, we would be looking at a low risk arrangement. On the other hand, these are the types of uh, higher risk arrangements that the ATO is looking out for. So firstly, where we have income splitting within the personal services entity. So that would be where you have an arrangement where substantial income is being distributed to associates or family members who did not happen to contribute significantly to the earning of the personal services income and where this would have the result of uh, a reduced overall tax liability. Also where we have profit retention. So if we have significant retention of income within a lower taxed entity, let's say we've got a company being taxed at 25%, uh, then um, if there was a deferral or a reduction of the overall tax liability, on that income, that could be considered a higher risk arrangement. Uh, and the, the third key indicator of a higher risk arrangement would be where you've got a disconnect between the income and the services. So if you've got a significant discrepancy between the value of services being provided uh, compared to the income distributed to the entity providing those services, that could uh, be a cause for concern. So we'll go through now, um, as I mentioned, the ATO set out a list of different indicators of low risk uh, arrangements and higher risk arrangements. So we'll, we'll go through and look at those and compare them between the two. So the first one that we would have as a low risk indicator is where the net PSI is distributed to the individual uh, whose personal efforts or skills generated the income and therefore that income is taxed at their marginal rate. So that's fairly straightforward. All of the income goes to the key individual and tax would be paid at their marginal tax rate. If we compare this to the higher risk indicator, that would be where you're distributing the net PSI or at least some of it to another entity, so it's taxed at an overall lower rate than if it had all gone to that individual. The second indicator we've got there uh, from a low risk perspective is where the remuneration that's received by the individual is substantially commensurate with the value of their personal services. So whatever the market value is of the services that they've provided, if that's the remuneration that they receive, uh, the ATO will consider that low risk. Compared to the higher risk column, if we've got remuneration being received by the individual that's less than what would be commensurate with the value, that's when it would be viewed as higher risk by the ATO. Similarly, if we're looking at uh, remuneration being paid to an associate, or even a service entity for bona fide services related to the earning of the personal services income. If that amount is reasonable for the services provided by them, that would be considered low risk. So to be low risk, we can still have payments going to associates uh, and service entities. It's just to be low risk needs to be as arm's length and as market value as possible. If we compare that to, sorry for jumping around a little bit, I'm in the, the bottom right cell at the moment. If we've got remuneration paid to an associate or a service entity that's not commensurate with the skills provided by the associate, normally you're paying them more than what would be market value, that could be an indicator of a higher risk arrangement. Uh, I'll jump back to uh, the bottom right uh, cell 
back on this slide. Um, so it would be a higher risk indicator if the business does not distribute any income to the individual who provided the actual services. It, that probably doesn't happen all too often and it would be quite uh, a risky and an extreme position to take. Um, but certainly if there's no income going to the key individual, that would certainly raise a large red flag for the ATO. Similarly, if you've got uh, the net personal services income or part of it being split with an associate of the individual and it results in a lower overall income tax liability, that could lead to uh, a higher risk arrangement being perceived by the ATO. Jumping back to uh, a low risk indicator in terms of timing, it says that if there is a timing difference between the earning of the income and the distribution of that income to the individual, that's okay and that can still be low risk as long as the explanation for it is that uh, it was outside the control of the individual and the business um, or where the delay can be explained by circumstances that are not attributable to tax. So, for example, if we've got uh, a company and um, we've got income derived within the company, but it, it might take a little while for um, the accounts to be finalised and so for any, dis any dividends to be declared, if it can be justified for a reason like that, um, and there is that timing difference, that's not going to um, increase the risk profile uh, with the ATO. Uh, if we jump down then to superannuation, of course, if we've got the business making a superannuation contribution on behalf of the individual who's an employee, for the purpose of providing a superannuation benefit. Um, of course, the business is required to do that and that's not going to increase the risk either. Uh, finally, this is the last indicator that we have provided by the ATO. If we look at the retention of profits from a low risk perspective, if you've got a temporary retention of profits for the purpose of acquiring an asset, uh, for a clear commercial purpose, that's okay from their perspective, that's considered low risk. But uh, from the other perspective, if we've got the net personal services income or some of it being retained in that business, and then they say that often those retained funds are made available to the individual for their personal use, normally through a complying Division 7A loan, um, the fact that the income is retained uh, in the business would be a sufficiently higher risk indicator. So those are the, the six different indicators of risk, um, both from a low risk and a higher risk perspective that the ATO would be weighing up when deciding whether or not Part 4A uh, has any potential application to a PSI arrangement. So obviously there's a fair bit of uh, material there, um, but as I mentioned, there are 13 different examples contained within the draft PCG. And I would encourage you um, after this session to go away and work your way through each of those because they are quite helpful in trying to ascertain how the ATO might apply these different provisions. Um, and there is a mix of low risk and higher risk uh, examples. So we'll go through two of each, um, both involving an interposed trust and an interposed company, um, just to get a flavour um, of how uh, this draft PCG might play out. So the first example that we have involves an interposed trust. And so we've got Eddie, an accountant who provides his services through a family trust, which is Eddie's accounting practice. Uh, and there's a company, Eddie Accounts Proprietary Limited, acting as the trustee of that trust. So the trustee company employs Eddie uh, and also Maggie as an administrative associate. And uh, the trustee company contracts out Eddie's services to different unrelated clients. Uh, the trust 
doesn't have any significant assets or other employees. And so it would qualify as a personal services entity because it is receiving Eddie's personal services income. And for the relevant income year, the trust self-assesses itself uh, as a personal services business because it meets one of the four relevant tests. And so it's, it's deemed that the PSI rules do not apply. And uh, the trustee company pays Eddie a fixed salary and also manages uh, its tax and superannuation obligations properly. Maggie, uh, the administrative associate, she gets paid according to the state award uh, and the net income of the trust is distributed to Eddie, who then includes that amount in his tax return uh, and pays tax on that amount at his marginal tax rate. So this arrangement would be considered low risk by the ATO as the personal services income is fully reported through Eddie's salary and through the trust distribution. So that example there is about as simple as it gets in terms of uh, the other employee getting paid um, according to the state award. So she gets paid at, at the market rate and then all of the other personal services income goes to Eddie either through his salary or through the trust distribution. Now, if we are having a circumstance like that, it's very clearly going to fall within the low risk category uh, and we're not going to have any, any chance of part 4A applying there. Similarly, if we look at uh, an interposed company example, let's say we have Ellen, who is an engineering consultant. She is operating through her company, which is called EBEC Proprietary Limited, where her and her de facto partner, Brody, they're the directors and shareholders of that company. The company contracts for Ellen Services with Ellen being the primary worker. And there is one other employee, Hooper, that provides administrative support. Um, much like uh, the last example, the company has no significant assets and receives its income primarily from Ellen's personal services, which means that it would be classified as personal services income. Again, we've we have it provided in the example that the company qualifies as a personal services business for the relevant income year, meaning that the PSI rules don't apply. Uh, the company pays Ellen a fixed salary, handles tax and superannuation, and distributes the net PSI to Ellen as a director's fee. Uh, this arrangement would again be considered low risk since Ellen's PSI is fully reported in her individual tax return through her salary and director's fees. So again, that's a very straightforward example where we see all of the personal services income, less the expenses, including um, the market rate salary paid to the other employee going to the key individual. If we jump now to some of the um, examples of a higher risk arrangement. We'll go back to a, a trust example. So let's say we have Kelly, a broker who transitions from operating as a sole trader to using a discretionary trust called the Kelly Trust to manage her personal services. The beneficiaries of the trust include Kelly, her de, her de facto partner, and also another family trust that she controls. There's a company, FTK Proprietary Limited, uh, that acts as the trustee of the Kelly Trust, which signs contracts for Kelly services. The Kelly Trust does qualify as a personal services entity due to its reliance on Kelly services for income and it is deemed to be a personal services business for the year. So again, the PSI rules do not apply. Now, instead of paying Kelly directly in this example, uh, the trustee company decides to distribute the trust net income equally between Kelly and the other 
Discretionary Trust, the KLY Family Trust. And from there, that trust decides to distribute the income to Kelly and her children. So the distributions that are ultimately made are not proportional to the value of Kelly services. And so this setup, while it was intended to limit Kelly's personal liability, it would result in a lower total tax payment due to income splitting. And since the distribution of the personal services income would result in a tax benefit, and it's not aligned with the value of Kelly services, the ATO would consider this situation to be a higher risk arrangement where they may look to apply part 4A um, for having a tax avoidance scheme. Similarly, if we look to a higher risk arrangement involving a company, we've got here Chester, who is a corporate consultant who previously was earning around about $400,000 a year from his various clients. And to reduce his tax liability, he sets up a private company, Consult Chester Proprietary Limited, at the beginning of the 2022-23 income year. Chester is the sole director of the company and its shareholder is uh, a corporate trustee of a trust that he controls. So the new company it enters into new contracts uh, with Chester's former clients for him to provide his personal services. Chester also contracts with CC for his services uh, and the income of the company is primarily from uh, his personal services income, which would make it a PSE. Again, the company self-assesses as a PSB on the basis that it meets one of those four tests. And so the PSI rules don't apply. Um, however, the company uh, pays Chester only $20,000 and keeps the rest of the income as profit. Chester then borrows this retained profit from the company for personal use and puts it on a complying Div 7A loan agreement. So the arrangement does not provide Chester with significant commercial benefits compared to his previous direct client dealings. That's the view of the ATO in this example. And uh, by keeping the profits in the company, Chester avoids including a substantial portion of his personal services income in his taxable income, which would result in less overall tax. And the ATO would consider this type of arrangement to be higher risk due to its potential for tax benefit, which could attract the application of Part 4A. The ATO does specify in this example that if the company had paid Chester a significant portion of the personal services income, such as 380 grand, then the risk of Part 4A enforcement would be lower and Chester might only receive compliance guidance uh, and monitoring. So in this example, we see quite, uh, quite an extreme position taken in that $20,000 or 5% of the net PSI uh, is distributed to Chester, which is obviously a very small amount, and the 95% um, being retained within the company and then lent uh, to Chester on Div 7A terms. So again, quite an extreme example and one which you can expect uh, would certainly necessitate a review or an audit by the ATO uh, for Part 4A reasons. The draft PCG does talk about record keeping and evidentiary requirements, because if the ATO were to uh, commence a review uh, and that were to progress to an audit, really the question that they're trying to determine is, was there a dominant purpose in this arrangement uh, to derive a tax benefit? So the key thing for the taxpayer um, as a result of this, draft, of this draft PCG is to make sure that they're keeping um, 
thorough and contemporaneous records of what was done and why it was done to try and substantiate the fact that it wasn't for the dominant purpose of obtaining a tax benefit. So it's really crucial to make sure that the taxpayer has uh, these records and keeps them um, for years to come in, in, into the future in the event of a review or an audit to try and defend against that potential argument being made. So these are some of the different types of documents um, that the ATO lists as being helpful or relevant um, to this type of uh, argument. And so what we have is different contracts. So between the individual, between the associates uh, and the personal services entities, and also between the entity and its clients, they should all be retained on file. Um, we also need to make sure we're keeping financial records. So we need to make sure we have bank statements, loan documents, any dividend or distribution statements, as well as comprehensive financial statements. We need to be keeping wage and superannuation records um, to confirm that wages were paid and superannuation contributions were made as well. And the point of that would be to show that what was paid to the various employees, subcontractors, um, whatever the case may be, was market rate and that they weren't being overpaid to try and derive a tax benefit that way. In terms of other documents that should be kept, um, we need to make sure we're keeping minutes and resolutions. So records of meetings, copies of trust deeds and any subsequent amendments, and also trustee resolutions. Um, and what we would certainly recommend in terms of those different resolutions is that um, they're probably more detailed um, than what may have been done in the past in terms of setting out the reasons why, if we are not just giving all of the income to the key individual, why are we giving that income to an associate or to a related company or trust, or why are we retaining that money within the company? That should all be set out as much as possible uh, within the resolution itself um, to try and create that evidence, to create that, that story as to why the tax benefit is not the dominant purpose in this case. So following on from that, we need to make sure we're keeping trust distribution statements to show uh, how the income was being distributed within the trust and contemporaneous records as much as possible, try to include um, that rationale and that information within the resolutions or the other documentation when the distributions are being made. If there were to be a part 4A issue in the future, uh, it's going to hold a lot more weight if we do have that contemporaneous evidence as opposed to trying to come up with various reasons why something was done many years into the future. So like I've put there, we need um, documentation of discussions or meetings explaining the transactions um, and the various decisions made by the trustee or the company uh, or whatever the entity may be. In addition, we want to make sure we're keeping records of um, any calculations or elections made uh, under the tax legislation. Um, so any choices, estimates, determinations or calculations um, with an explanation of how they were reached. What happens if the taxpayer doesn't have sufficient documentation? Well, this will just increase the likelihood that there will be an ATO audit and that penalties could be imposed um, because proper documentation is really essential to try to substantiate that the primary purpose of the arrangement is not to obtain a tax benefit. Um, because we need, to, we need to be mindful of the fact um, that there is the reverse onus within tax disputes. Uh, and so if the ATO determines that the objective purpose of um, such an arrangement was to obtain a tax benefit, 
then the, tax, uh, the taxpayer needs to make sure that they've got sufficient evidence, detailed evidence from uh, when the arrangement was put in place to overturn that, to show that there was another dominant purpose for why things were done the way they were done. So in terms of where we are and where we go to from here with the draft PCG, it is open for public consultation until the 11th of October. So just under a month to go there. And so any stakeholders, including tax professionals and other businesses, they are welcome to provide any feedback to the ATO to make sure that the guideline effectively addresses any practical issues or concerns that they may have. Once that date has come and gone, the ATO will be reviewing that feedback and will be finalising the PCG from there. As to how long that would take, I'm not quite sure. That's always a bit um, open-ended, but I, I consider it unlikely that there would be many, many changes or many major uh, alterations to the position that they've set out within the draft PCG, particularly because it is consistent uh, with the earlier tax ruling in 2022. And so once that is finalised, the PCG will apply to any arrangements that are entered into both before and after the release date uh, of the final PCG. So just to conclude the webinar, um, obviously, before this draft PCG, we did have that tax ruling and we did have that indication from the ATO that Part 4A could apply to circumstances where you have um, a personal services business and the PSI rules don't apply. We already knew that and we had a bit of a brief understanding as to some of the considerations as to what might trigger a Part 4A query. But this draft PCG does expand on that. It does provide some helpful indicators to taxpayers um, and to the community as to what they would be looking at in terms of the lower risk arrangements and the higher risk arrangements. And so what should taxpayers be doing as a result of this? They should really be reviewing what their PSI arrangements are in light of the draft PCG to make sure that they are complying with the PSI rules if they do apply, uh, and also the general anti-avoidance provisions of Part 4A. But really the key part of this is that it's super important to make sure we have that proper documentation in place um, and that we've got it kept on file in the event of a review or audit um, to try and mitigate the risk of there being a finding that the dominant purpose was to obtain a tax benefit. All right, so I think I've done all right, Adrian. I've wrapped up with 10 minutes to go. So I imagine there's a, a few questions for me to answer. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, there is a couple. Um, and as I said at the start, um, you know, some of them are kind of scenario based, so we may not get a chance to properly examine them. And of course, as usual, You've normally got to ask a few more questions to kind of clarify some things, uh, but we'll do our best. And uh, for everyone that's put in a chat or a question and answer in the separate Q&A box, uh, we will come back to you separately if we don't get a chance to. So first one, uh, Kate, um, does the draft PCG discuss how to determine whether it is the business that earns the income? Therefore, PSI rules aren't required. Uh, I think that's more covered within the 2022 tax ruling, so 2022 slash three. Um, that ruling there goes through what is PSI, what's a PSB, what are the different indicators of whether there is personal services income or not. Um, so, yeah, I would refer you to that tax ruling, which covers that in a, a lot more detail. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a really specific to say, well, you're in a PS. B, this is when we're going to apply resources for part 4A. Yeah. Uh, could we segregate classification into three categories, PSI, PSB and business structure? Um, realistically, yes, that's the, the three sorts of categories um, in terms of this world. A uh, question, uh, does goodwill count as an asset earning income for business structure? 
Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but my, my gut feeling is probably no, um, if, if the goodwill is very much linked to the individual and the value that they bring to the business um, through their personal services income, um, I would think, yeah, that, that's not going to be counted as an asset earning income. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I mean, the goodwill, as you say, is going to be linked to the individual in these types of scenarios. Um, in this example, and apologies, Colonel, um, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Hopefully, Kate remembers it. If, and if not, we'll come back to you. If there are accounting staff working in the practice, would it still be a PSB, perhaps PSB? Yeah, um, I think that's probably one of the examples where there was just one um, admin staff working within the business. If there were more accounting staff that were contributing to the actual income earned by the business, um, then we would be looking at uh, I think it's called the employment test, where at least 20% of the income has to be earned by those other staff members. Um, if that were to be satisfied, then it would be um, a PSB and the PSI rules wouldn't apply. Okay, thanks, Kate. Can you confirm the effect of a loss year in a company if taking the deduction, the personal return, as in a profit year, income will be attributed to the individual loss year has the effect of creating a Div 7 8 debit loan or is it a retained earnings entry? I'll field that one for you, Kate. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, in, in a loss year for a, a PSI or PSB, the loss is attributed to the individual, so it's not kept in the company, if, if I could put it that way. Uh, so the individual claims their loss in the individual tax return. If they don't have enough other income, then they carry it forward, of course. My understanding, and I'm not an accountant in terms of the way that it's put in, is that it's recorded as a non-deductible expense. Uh, so I would presume that's going to be going to the retained earnings entry eventually, as opposed to a loan because, uh, or debit loan, because it's not an amount that's going to be paid back at any stage. Um, what happens in the case of a PSB business trading in a company, but the entity also operates another business? What happens if the other business runs at a loss? How does that affect the distribution of income? Any thoughts, Kate? It's a tough one. Um, <laughs> a few different questions there in that one. So that, yeah. we'll come back to you separately on that one to clarify a few things. Um, uh, from Greg, does this replace the previous PCG on professionals income splitting and the green, amber, red tests and the numbering system to work this out? Um, no, I, I don't think it does, does it, Adrian? I think, um, I no. think yeah, yeah. they both still operate separately. Yeah, separately. Professional services business are viewed differently for whatever reason by the tax office uh, to other sorts of PS, personal services businesses. So it's still, it doesn't replace it there. Um, If there's a mortgage broking business run in a trust, but the only income being received is ongoing trail income, would that income be considered PSI? Uh, I, I think that would depend on how, how the trail income was acquired. So which individuals were responsible for um, obtaining that loan or that um, finance uh, facility. So, yeah, I think it would be a matter of looking back at who actually was responsible for um, getting that deal across the line and, and earning that trail income. Yeah, I mean, the, the trail traditionally is kind of attached to the loan, isn't it? So it's more, it's not yeah. so much PSI, it's, yeah, it's income of an asset. Um, do we have any historical cases of Part 4 applications to these scenarios? Isn't Part 4A too wide and can catch anything? From a resourcing point of view, is the ATO resourced enough? Kate, any thoughts on that? Um, I don't think I've... I, I haven't personally seen any um, Part 4A cases where we're looking at PSI and PSBs. Um, Yes, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if any if any cases do come through the courts looking at those particular issues. Yeah, uh, I can't think of any that we've acted for that spring to mind. I mean, there's been a couple where they've suggested that they apply Part 4A as usual, but um, 
uh, none where they've actually applied it uh, in these sorts of scenarios. Uh, I, I mean, realistically, this, these sorts of obligations are, are behaviour management, if I could put it that way, because they put them out saying this is what we're going to do, and then they know a lot of people will take effectively the ATO view and, and run with that. Um, so they, they get compliance without having to put any resources to it in terms of going to your second question there uh, or third question in relation to the resourcing. Yeah, and sorry, just another point. I don't know if everybody else's experience is consistent with ours, but certainly recently we're finding such long delays in terms of the ATO processing anything really from private rulings to objections to even um deducted a gift recipient applications, everything is certainly taking a lot longer than it used to. So yeah. we're not as well resourced um, as, it, as it would need to be to really um, prosecute all of these issues. Yeah, that's right. Um, considering the time, I know there's a couple more questions there, but I think that kind of fall in the category. We're probably going to have to ask a couple more details. So uh, in the interest of time and uh, also just to let you know, if you put those questions in, we will come back to you separately. Um, but I'll close it off there, just reminding you that uh, there will be a, uh, a, um, a feedback question. There's only four or five questions on it, most of which you can answer by clicking on a smiley face. Uh, but probably the most important thing is um, suggestions for future topics. I'd like to thank Kate for her presentation. Has been a few comments complimenting Kate uh, on it, and I wish to add my compliments to that as well. Uh, very thorough and an excellent presentation in the circumstances. So I'll close it off there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.